Hello there. Hello, everyone watching this, whether you're catching up with it live or whether you're watching it um, in the evening, the morning. Uh, I'm Martin Cross, and with me, as you can see, is the one and only Tom James. Tom, welcome to Cross's Corner. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, uh, we were talking just before we went on air, and uh, it does seem, and you must have this reflection, that your life is now completely different to what it was when you were rowing about seven or eight years ago. I mean, would you just like to explain where you're up to at the moment? I, I can, um, if I can remember anything from like the last year or so, I can certainly try. Um, I mean, well, yeah, literally, um, just putting Theo down to bed five minutes ago, just in time to get onto this. <laughs> that like, that's the first thing my life is completely different having a kid. Um, and it's more than seven or eight. It's 10, yeah, 10 years. 10 year anniversary for London this year. Is it? Uh, oh, God, yeah. Which, yeah, like, I, don't know, I do not, where's the last decade gone? Life just goes so quickly. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, family, kids, um, a job. Like for the last ten years, um, you know, not not sitting around. Well, actually, I know I'm back working right here. I'm sitting in the track seat a lot, but like, you know, the like was disappeared, um, thankfully. But it's uh, yeah, it's just you know, you, you move into the next phase of life, um, and yes, yeah, so I'm well into my second career, I guess you can say, which is you know, obviously um, the business career, trying to make a successful business career, whatever that is these days, is all changing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, and and from rowing, I think the last the last couple last couple of years from COVID and then Thea coming along is too too years old, um, and then changing jobs. I'm I'm somewhat detached. This is the furthest I've been from from the rowing world. So this is going to be quite fun to sort of test my memory or bring back some of the memories and you know see what I can recall. And actually, um, yeah, look, I guess it's nice to be able to look back at it within perspective. You know, particularly over the last ten years, um, oh, that's gone by. So I'm um, interested in what you're going to be asking me, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm going to. I wonder, did you get a chance to watch this year's boat race? Because I know you used to be quite involved with Cambridge, uh, but it must have been a bit of a stretch to find time to watch it. I guess. Um, yeah. This. Uh, so I used. I, I, I've. Yeah. Obviously, a massive Cambridge supporter, and um, I've been heavily involved involved since i competed and afterwards um on the on one of the committees and you know as much as i could try and help any of the crews in a limited way usually the opposite um uh, but uh i think the last couple of years i've and, and also i think because the race obviously had one year uh one year of not 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 occurring um it came up on my radar really late and then we'd just be looking to try and buy a house and we've got another baby during two days and so and then changing jobs in our last couple of weeks whatever these were made. So I watched it on mute um and didn't see much of the before or after but I had my I didn't didn't get to go to the the after, you know, the the, yeah. the dinner afterwards, which I think was fantastic by all accounts. And you know the club, the two the two Cambridge has had a big shift over recently with the clubs coming together and by all accounts that's going, you know, going incredibly well. Um, obviously, you know, there's always you know, change and things like that which got to be, be bedded in. Um, uh, so it's good, you know, I mean, we had we had one women's, you know, had the women's race win, uh, the men's crew lost. Um, and I mean, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, from the outside, I think both crews were pretty stacked, some phenomenal talent. So I think the main thing was like, you know, either way. It was a great race to, to be able to see two really high quality crews from the from the men's perspective and from the women's perspective. Um, but obviously, from the men's, I think from my side, when I saw the, I mean, it, the, the the Cambridge outfit looked like a very tidy, good crew, yeah. and run together really well. Um, I think I saw one of the fixtures as well where they competed against Brooks, and they got into the first piece was rubbish. Yeah, and just, you know, they didn't get into a pattern and get a hold of anything, and then the second one they settled into a really, really nice pattern. Um, I didn't hear any of the comments after. It didn't look like they quite got that in the race. So it was a really nice pattern, but if they just sort of settled maybe earlier and strode out and got hold of it, then, you know, maybe, maybe they had more speed. But uh, either way, the Oxford crew was pretty phenomenal by all accounts. So even if they'd, you know, found those to speed, whether they won, I, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, they, they can certainly be pretty proud of it because it, was, it looked like both crews looked really, really high quality and fantastic crews. Um, 
I reckon I reckon in some ways it was a bit similar to t the 2005 boat race, which of course you'll remember, which which had a very strong Oxford crew, like very yeah. strong. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that one up. I actually don't <laughs> remember any of my boat races without it being a loss, apart from the last one. Um, 2005 was actually there's a couple of similarities because we chose Middlesex as well. Ah. Uh... The only commentary after is why they chose Middlesex. My guess is they they, they knew they were going to be in a tough race. And so by choosing metal sets, you've got a better chance of being in the race longer and you might win it on the outside and, and yet. But the reality is by choosing metal sex, you always make your life harder and so it's harder to be in a closer race because yeah. you're probably going to get away. So it's it's always a tough one. Uh, I don't know what the right city like. If you can get it right in middle sex, then you look really good. But... Trying to try to predict a long, a, trying to predict a close race over four and a quarter miles is really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what we did in two thousand and five. We thought we'll go with Middlesex because it's going to be close, or you know, but you know, it, it's you, you win it in key moments usually in the first half. Um, it's like I think the saying is like cricket, isn't it? You you if you win the toss, you think about you think about bowling first, or you know, going batting second. But then you think about it, but then you always bat first. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. If you do go out and you do, you, you put pressure on yourself straight away to perform it, so you've got to get it right. Like you've got to, you've, you've got to nail the early part of the race. Um, and you're also taking some of the pressure off the opposition because they think, well, you've given me the better option. Um, so, but it's not a sit like, you know, it's, it's, I always think, I, I never say the wrong decisions because there's always probability. Like, always, it always turns out and you can make it work. Um, but it's just sort of law of averages sometimes when you look back on past results. So you can always yeah. say that afterwards, but they, they, you know, if it had worked in its place, then they'd have looked amazing. So, um, uh, and yeah, yeah. 2005, but it was, it was, we were, we were a fast outfit. Like it was a good crew that in Oxford had turned more speed. Now had Hodgie Stroke here and a powerful unit behind him. And they, they improved over the last two to four weeks. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, quite easily, easily beats us on the day. Um, I know uh, we're going to talk about your 2007 boat race uh, shortly, but I, I just wanted to ask for any memories you had or the the way you look back on it, if you ever do, on that 2003 boat race, yeah. which was your first boat race. You were in the sixth seat. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. Um, the, yeah, so the context for 2003 was um, we obviously lost by a foot. So uh, for four and a quarter miles, and then yeah, then you lose it on the last bit. Um, it was, uh, and it was also the year we we had a crash the week before. So Wayne Wayne Palmer, we lost from the Valsey because we we crashed into it was a mix up. We're turning with PLA turning in front of us, and they were ironically clearing the river because we were about to do a start, <laughs> and we did a start and crashed into them, and then snapped out of blades. Um, so it's a bit of upset, which I think probably did affect us a little bit. But regardless. Um, Oxford had an outstanding race and put us under pressure. We then didn't have as good a row as we should have because we're under pressure. Um, and I think, yeah, like pretty poor bits of the race, you know, down at like 32 and bits where we should have been driving on and, um, and whatnot. But, um, the, the thing, the thing that I think close races always leave you with is like, you always think, well, what if? Yeah. You should have just got this bit right. Like you should have just, like, and particularly in the last 20 metres, we could have just pulled a little bit harder and we might have made it. Or the boat would have been adjusted slightly differently. Or, you know, there's no, like, because there's not been a race that close, no one's really bothered to define a real finishing line. So it's just like when the <laughs> sweeping over and it just, oh, we're going to figure that out. Oh, that's a foot. Because um, basically the person who's, like, putting the yeah. on that is, like, calls it well, a foot. And then the camera's like, well, I better adjust it. Like, like, I don't know. Um, but it, no, it doesn't take it away. Like, that's the result. And that's what you end up living with. The problem is you end up thinking about well the what if afterwards and that's the nature of the sport that's we buy in. So yeah. I wouldn't about it, but that's not the reality anymore. Um, you you had you you must have had therefore because uh, coming off the off the back of um, having lost the boat race three times, there was a lot of pressure on that two thousand and seven year for, for a lot of reasons, not least of which you were president and you yeah. had a pretty stacked crew. Yeah, no we did. We did have a stacked crew. We had we had Torsten, Seb, Kiri, and myself um, 
in the first forward, like, well, no, we had Kip and Dan in the bows, like internationals, and then good unit with um, uh, I'm afraid of my crew, Pete. Uh, <laughs> he's gonna, my mind's gone. Um, four seat, he's gonna kill me. Um, not seen him for years, actually. Not Pete Marsland, no, not Pete's like Martin, no. Um, oh, why, why does it always happen when you're suddenly getting tested? Um, yeah, big champion, and we'll come back later on. Yeah. Last. And I'm not, you know, obviously losing my mind at the moment, not much sleep. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a strong crew. But we we had quite a few, like, because a lot of us had lost the previous year and not a lot of confidence in in how we were rowing and building out that crew and, like, changing a few things around. Um, I think when we went into the race, it was still like we we had done the the eights head the week before and 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 had won it um, to try and you know find key points to give us confidence building in right. Um, yeah. And it was like we you know it had a period of if you think back some of those years, a bit of changing with different co- coaches and you don't have something settled. You're trying to look for reasons why you're going to win. And in the boat race, you need that because there's only you in Oxford, there's only you in the opposition. You've got no test beforehand. You might do some, uh, you might do some, um, you know, trials against other crews, but there's no way to calibrate. Um, so you've, you've, so what do you hang your confidence on? Well, usually it's the overall system and it's the coach. And so if you've got something behind you to rely, rely on that, then you yeah. just ask less questions and you just fit into your groove and then you grow more confidently. And then, um, you know, there's a very different feel to being in a system where, you you just you got a you just got a natural belief that you're or entitlement that you should just go and win races, which you know for a number of years in GB you could feel that, and for a couple of years at Cambridge and then you know that was definitely missing, so it was harder to find that. You know, it's more up and down, um, and that's the nature when you're either an underdog or something's not you know not always fitting, um, and so you've got to generate it as a crew. And I think we heard that we basically trying to take proof points through the year. So the four had won, fours had the unit, the four, so we kept that together. Um, you know, tried to also try to find combinations that that work together. Because also you do end up with different, part of the challenge of any rowing boat is you've got different different rowing patterns trying to blend together. I mean, that's the yeah. whole thing about the sport, right, is you have this idea that everyone rows together and you all row perfectly, but it's never like that. And particularly yeah. Cambridge, because it's one year and you get, the melting pot of all these patterns. So you, you've got to fit, you've, you've, you either force a structure on that or you try and fit around key people and get people to understand that and build confidence in that pattern, like how you, you know, how you're going to drive basically to win a race in that pattern. Um, and then we, so we went with Torsten and Seb, who, you know, who've been fantastic in a pair, won, won eight, you know, won the four header in the year, you know, that's, that's, that was a pattern to set up that crew. But it was quite particular. And a bit different how I I, I rode, and to the Canadians in the bow seat completely different, right? So you've got to you've got to <laughs> you've got to, you've got to like understand that pattern. How you gonna how you gonna um, win the race off that? Um, and then yeah, in the race, uh, yeah, we were put we were on the outside and put under a lot of pressure. But I, we we because we had at least managed to nail down a consistent pattern, which it wasn't the best speed like we could have got out of the crew, but it was enough. That's what. That's what counted. So when we finally came around, I think it was, you know, the, the outside of Hammersmith and even though we we're down half a length, you know, managed to eat away and, and hold on to a structure of pattern to keep us through in the last half. Um, but we didn't have too many, like, tools up our sleeve. It wasn't a crew that could, like, suddenly switch on a bit of boat speed or, like, you know, just jack it up to a certain rate and go for it. It was it was finding something that, that worked enough to make sure we won that year. It was a bit more of a... Uh, yeah, it was, it was hard um, because you don't have that backstory, right? And you don't have all the ingredients, yeah. you know. Whereas Oxford have been developing that with Sean since late like, nice. And what Cambridge had with Robert and, you know, when Harry Martin, Martin was helping as well, right? That's the that's what you're trying to get into. You're constantly trying to create that. You're constantly trying to create, a, you know, that sort of like buffer around you of, of your identity. But it also just makes it so much easier when people come into the system. You fit into that and you just buy into it. And you naturally pick up on the people around you. You naturally pick up on the people who have who have come from the previous year, and it just starts to work. Um, when you don't have that, it won't, you start asking questions. You're constantly looking at this thing. You're trying to do your thing. You're not thinking about fitting with everyone else. You know, it's um, it's it's a harder game to try and try and get those results out of it. 
Yeah, um, that that race. I know you you had said if you hadn't have won that race, you probably would have stopped rowing. Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is a pretty big call considering you got two Olympic gold medals after two thousand and seven. Um, so, yeah, um, but it. I mean, it was pretty. My rowing career until then had been pretty. Like, yes, making the Cambridge crew, um, I think, you know, as an undergrad first year going to Athens, you know, those were all fantastic achievements. But it didn't feel like achievements because I had had really bad experiences. Yeah. <laughs> like, as much as I remember going to Athens and thinking, great, going to Athens, but because it was, it was a terrible experience from a competing point of view. Did not want to talk about it. Did not want to be recognised or known for having to go go to Athens. Um, but that's not to detract from any of those experiences, because you uh, you you learn you do learn so much more from when you lose and when you win because you reflect on it and you dwell on it. Like two thousand and three, um, why we lost that race. Like I unpicked the, that race quite extensively yeah. afterwards. Same with two thousand five. Same in two thousand six. Um, and uh yeah same with athens athens was 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 a um the spit the, the year leading into that was a, an incredibly useful experience because it told me all the things a lot of things i shouldn't have done or yeah. need to make sure you don't happen again when you then go into other other cycles um and of course also you know you you, you that and that, that's probably a negative way to look at it there's lots of positives you also do naturally take away from all of this all of them. It's just at the time you end up really miserable about it, and I ended up really miserable um, for a number of my years at, at university because I'd lost boat races and lost other races. And then um, 2007 was, uh, um, I think I was pretty relaxed in going into the race actually, but I think afterwards it was, yeah, it it was a um, a pretty. It, it, it like there, there was quite a lot of relief that actually came out gradually after that, which had built up. Um, and yeah, I, I think I'd have probably, if I'd lost that, I'd have been miserable and just turned my back on it. Yeah. Yes. And that's it. And then, um, you know, that which is like, like I'm not gonna, like, I'm not one of those people who are going to say I've got all the determination in the world. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who are constantly driven for everything. I need a, I need some, you know, you need yeah. you need some proof that it's, you got you're going to get something out of this. Um, so yeah, I might might well have done. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, that having said that, like the trials would have been the week after. That's what's daft. As soon as you do the boat race, the trials yeah. are usually the week after, and it gives you an opportunity. And usually, my trials performances after the boat race have always, have always been very good. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I might well have just said, "Sod it, it's not working." Um, you you weren't one of Jürgen Grobler's favourite athletes that year. It's probably fair to say. Um, <laughs> and there, um, there's there's no. an interesting story of you um, uh, being. Were you, was that the year you were given a chance to sub in the four at Lucerne? Um, yeah, two thousand and seven. I think Alex had an injury or was ill, so yeah, I subbed in. Yeah, and, and it didn't go didn't go great. Well, it, were you saying that's why I wasn't Jürgen's favourite that year? <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting because you got put. You got put. It was you and Tom Parker, wasn't it, on training camp, and you got put on the on some results of some race that you. So, so you're, picking up, you're picking up quite an interesting thread on selection and GB. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how deep you want to go into that, but it's. Um, yeah, we can go into that. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> but oh, it's, um, so it was the time when they're, they're trying to centralise the system. I was still at university and uh, still at my year to do so. We had a bit of an issue about funding because, and if you if you um, if you uh, if you want to train centrally, then they'd move the the um, uh, the requirement that you got your funding if you if you transcend and if you went back to university then you don't get it. So my funding was cut. We had a bit of an argument about that um, because obviously you know undergrad trying to still go back and do university. Um, 
And I think it was a mix because slightly changing the goalposts at the time. At least that's how I interpret it. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, and then it, you know, so there, there's always a bit of politics and nudging, right? They're trying to force a, a structure. Uh, and most, a lot of athletes, you know, some, every, every, you know, some people bought into that straight away. I don't think I bought into it straight away. Um, because I was trying to finish my degree. Um, uh, but naturally, as they're leading into Olympic cycle, then they wanted people to be central. Um, but anyway, I came down after um, after the after finishing that year, um, and uh, I don't think I, I can't I can't remember how I did at trials. Probably not amazingly. Um, and I think I was hanging about and basically there was a seat available for the four. And I, I think I was literally like just somebody who was left over to, and then having in the four. But I think that was just, um, an opportunity to get into the, to, to be, I honestly can't remember a lot of the sequences of it. Um, it went okay. I mean, we got a silver, but, uh, I don't, I don't think I, I, well, maybe I did get blamed for that. I don't know. I didn't think I did. Um, yeah. I would like to have got the gold and like to have made the, the, that four work better for being in it, but I don't think that necessarily happened. Um, but look, how old was I then? 22, 21? Yeah, that's um, so young. That's so young, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it's hard going to someone else's crew, right? You got, yeah. I mean, you had Podgy and Peter. Right? Yeah, so it was, it was the similar combination that was going to be Beijing the next year. But, um, it, uh, it, 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 and it was only a couple of weeks and trying to make things, you know, work on a, on a short period to then go to trials and have the same expectation of winning in it as the four had been at that point. Um, and again, you've got to fit into someone else's pattern and so you've got to sort of work around that. Um, I, look, and then that year was, was a funny year um, because I don't think I was... <laughs> Because of that issue, I don't think I was uh, necessarily people's favourite. And um, so selection didn't particularly go my way. Um, one could say maybe not always given the opportunity, but it, you know, all, all that washed through and we got a bronze medal in the eight, um, which was awesome, actually, because I, I came into it later. Tom Parker was selected in the eight. Um, he unfortunately got ill, so i i was the last sub and then subbed into the bow seat and it was like an amazing bus ticket because basically the boat had been set up and just came in and sat in the bow seat and um uh the final was the final was one of, it was a good final because one of the i think i think um the, the eight obviously went on right got like a phenomenal outfit like the guys in the boat right yeah uh, were probably kept, well, they, they got silver the next year and were like a, very good outfit and capable of winning in Beijing. And it was, I think, yeah, the, 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 the obviously the key reason that year, and I think they're still figuring a few things out and off the start, it was, it was a bit sort of soft and not quite getting hold of it. And then halfway, I think you could just see like Josh and Rick, Rick Eggington in the middle of the start to put, put some power down. When you're in the bow seat of an eight, that's just churning it out. You just start to move through the rest of the pack. It's just all sort of, you just sort of shouting, go, go. And then you're, going, <laughs> you're pushing again and, we almost got the Germans on left, or maybe it was the Canadians who were out ahead. Um, and yeah, that felt then like in a really good position then going into Beijing for the year ahead to like be a good platform. Oh yeah, I think it was maybe it was 30 years bronze, but we had Germany who felt could have got Germany on our left hand side and they had the, they had the easier lane than Munich to always get the Yeah, yeah, on. yeah. And, um, and then Germany imploded that year. So it always could that, that was the time, that was when eight, they used you to always be that um pattern where the crew that got silver in the penultimate year of the olympiad went on to win yeah so there was a feeling i remember thinking well then that eight was basically the silver medal so they're going to win next year um uh but yeah that was um i'm not going to go into it more than that but like either way it worked out fine and yeah um, it set me up you, it set me up pretty well for the year after and we uh got in and then, then Colin, it was Colin and I, Colin and I in the pair. That was it. Got to bring it back because 2006 we rode the pair. And yeah. The worlds didn't go so well, but we'd shown a lot of speed in training, a lot of a lot of speed in in trials, um, and that was good. Fun. That was a good. It was a fun pair um, to to race because, like you know, small little two two guys who who whose ergos were terrible and. Yeah, what so, was your ergo when you were doing the pair? Was it something like 605, 606, was it? It was about there, 605, 606. 
I think in Milan I was 6.15. <laughs> I mean, I got it better than that pretty quick. I think I was 5... I did a 5.56.7 before Beijing. So that was my best one. And then leading up to London, I, I never got to do a... Pathetically, never got to do a proper 2K. And I was always, like, injured or slightly... <laughs> some sort of, like, pathetic illness had come about just when I was a 2K or something. I wasn't always the most well with around injuries, I seem to remember. But you, you had to really yes, push. Yes, I think I had a couple of unlucky things which just kept bugging me. Sorry? You had, you had to really push to get in that Beijing four because I remember you, you talking about um, you and Colin being the little guys. You weren't really being given a chance in terms of seat racing um, when you were away in Marese. I think we had been thought of. I think we, we were in the channel for, tr for like being guided for doing the pair. So the eight was being created and you see the four. And I think we were like going to be, I think anyway, probably the pair, right? So you can yeah. see those combinations being gradually created. Um, but I think Colin and I recognized if we we're going to do the pair that year, who was Beijing, yeah, you had Drew Jin and um, Duncan Free. It's like, yeah. that's going to be a tall order to, to win. So if we're going to win, you probably want to be in the eight or the four. So that was a realistic decision from us. Um, so, yeah. And again, um, that means you then got to, you got to remind people you should be in one of the couple of these C races. And I wasn't in some of those C races. And then kindly, I think uh, a few of the coaches made sure I was in some of the C races. And then, and then, yeah, it's funny how selection goes. Like the final bit of selection was, was all a bit weird when you got really bad weather. So because sometimes, it's not like it's not satisfying. You think you get selected and it's not, but if the result's not clear for, say, for, for when you're getting seat race, it's like, well, that's a bit deflating because you, you want a sort of like stamp of that was part of like off, off the back of Beijing because, um, whilst winning, you know, it was still, it was a little bit like still the, the bus, the getting the lucky bus ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, you got Hodge GP and Steve, right, who'd won all four and, you know, Arguably, he probably stuck someone else in the bow seat and he may well have won. Um, so, you know, having a bit of like feeling and recognition that that seat and you've had that impact, um, then the, then leading into London and then four years afterwards were, were much more satisfying from that perspective. That's really interesting you say that I, because um, you you had to, well, I know you had a last seat race, I think, against uh, Matt Langridge um, yeah. out in Verese. Uh, which I think you won by about half a length or three quarters of a length or something. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then it wasn't the greatest of seasons in terms of the run up to Beijing. I seem to recall. No. Uh, the, Tom, no, Tom the, Lucy. Yeah. Tom, so Tom, so what happened? Um, as soon as got selected, my back went. <laughs> um, and so I was out of the first race. Tom Lucy was in, and the four started going fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they won the first race. And then Hodgie got injured. And I remember thinking, I do remember thinking, I'm not disappointed Hodgie's injured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't race the second race. Because uh, if they just carried on with that unit, you can see the pattern going if you like, you're out for a couple of races, even if you got selected. <clears throat> well, that four's working, and you, you know, this lining up. That, that's how some of these things happen. So I wouldn't have entirely trusted I would have stayed in that seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, the the four, the four, the four probably didn't have a great race in Lucerne. <clears throat> but anyway, then we, we put the four. Then Hodgie recovered, Pete, Steve, and then I. And then we had probably not long before the final race, actually, in Poznan. Um, but I remember we did a very good time in training. We did a 5.43 or something in, in a set piece. And that, like, you, it's amazing when you look back on the run up to these things. Like, it's different for every individual, but like how you rely on like points of confidence or points of, that give you reason to know you should go and, you know, you're justified in winning. For me, it's always, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who are just sold on my own belief of like, I'm going to turn up and win. I, I can't go into a season saying, right, I'm going to win this year. I'm not that person. Um, for me, it's like building up a base of not just evidence, but 
you know, it's building up momentum and it's building up the justification. Um, and I say it's taken me, that took me quite a long time to feel that. And it probably, I didn't feel that until 2011 and then into London, like a justification yeah. for, for feeling justified that I, I can, I can go out and say I should go, I, 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 I can go and win this and be in that crew and feel like I can, I've got the, the ability or now to, to know how to go and do this. Was that uh, a bit of imposter syndrome? Maybe it's imposter, but it's also perfectly natural. It's like you're trying to win an Olympic gold medal and then like what, you know, what's your, um, uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it is imposter syndrome. I think it's slightly different. I think it's, um, just a natural way of trying to, to rationalize your chances of going into this race when, you, you know, a lot of things are not in your control. Um, <clears throat> and the way I've tried to rationalize it is, is, um, cause you end up with this sort of catch 22 when I, you've got to have loads of belief. And if you really believe in what you're doing, then you go out and you win it. But like, where do you get your belief from? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you've got to go and prove stuff to then get your belief. Well, to, to prove it, well, like, where do you begin? <laughs> um, so, uh, and that's why for me, it's sort of, um, it's, it's sort of gradually picking things apart. Right. And yeah, there's, there, that's, that's why you need results in the season. Like you need to be tested. That's why you need so, lots of selection. You need lots of races that are tough races to, to prove and build up that evidence and to test yourself and to test that combination and creep because nearly all the time, um, I think for me, I've always found you will, you'll, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be mo most confident when you know you can consistently repeat something you've done in training, where you consistently repeat yeah. stepping up. It's when your results are like, how are you going to perform? It's like, high into, like, I might do a really good result or I might not. I don't, and I don't know how to go and create this result. That's the bit I like would always be. The, the concern, right? They're always a bit going about, and that's what I felt for the majority. Of it. And that's I remember thinking with with Athens or like some occasions, like if you can't control how you're going to go out and race, you, you always have this real uncertainty, right? Like you've got to feel like I've got control over how this race is going to go. Uh, like yeah. Gonna, go off this start, it's going to feel like this. When we strike, when we settle out, I'm going to settle out early because I know I can get into the pattern, I get a hold of it, and then we're going to walk through. Um. Uh, and. Uh, and I'm also somebody who overcomplicates things before I start simplifying it. So you've, I, I've, you know, and I, I've, I'd say in the latter couple of years, managed to really simplify things in my head and actually changed. I remember actually Athens was really useful for a number of reasons, also because um, I really, I guess one of the things I've, you know, learned through that is you get really hung up on a particular way of rowing. Yeah. Rowing is full of different the sport of rowing is full of lots of different religions and people with different beliefs of technical patterns, right? We all like fit into these buckets. This is how you should row. And every club has got this thing, any pattern. I've, I've very rarely come across a coach or anyone who, who looks at the career and says, we're going to row this way for these guys. Or like, we're going to try this way over here, like it's a different pattern. <laughs> like, no evidence that there's one best way. You know, you look at world records in the eight or something, like they're all, they're all being swapped over by crews that row completely differently every other year. The Canadian yeah. year, the German's completely different, the US one year, you know. The, it, um, and I think in the last couple, I, I remember changing how I thought, particularly around like looking at the US, because the US was so, I remember being in Athens, we were very negative of how the US were rowing and like the pattern, they're hanging on the catch and like this stupid yeah. leg, like, like Canadians, whatever. And they go out and they win the race and they head with it like 35. And, you know, this amazing pattern in Volkenheim and stroke, like just really sort of like just commanding and long and like a, a very, a very understand, you know, just like power, there's no, no drama around it. Um, and I just couldn't get my head around like how I had such a negative picture of this. And then this thing, you know, goes and wins a world record and just look. And actually, if you look at the overall package, like a really well-timed, you know, powerful pattern. And then, yeah. you know, I was hunched over, things not always looking pretty, but like, who cares? And then, so going into the last couple of years, I remember really thinking differently about um, just, <laughs> just getting away from like the nitty gritty of like technical things. And it's like the fundamentals of a, of a solid pattern, having to create that. Um, 
Where are we going with this? Like, I've gone on a complete tangent. I don't even know. Yeah, what I no, no. I think yeah. where 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 I wanted to go was I I kind of wanted you to relate that in terms of to oh. to have a background in terms of being self confident. I know because to look at that yeah. Olympic final in Beijing, because you had you had wins in your your heat in the semi going into that yeah. race, but. Yeah. So I guess you must have been quite confident and you must have had a race plan, which very quickly didn't turn out to be such a good race plan, the way um, the Australians raced that. It's not quite. We, we recognise we're, we're, we're actually still quite a young crew, right? Yeah. We've not had much time together. Um, so we were still learning from each race to each race. Um, the heat, I can't quite remember, but I remember the semi-final pretty well. And the semi-final was really good. Um, and you know, it's a complete package that came together, got out into the lead, and I think we just walked away. I can't remember if the Australians were in that race. Maybe I think not. they might have been. They might have been. I think we won, and we felt we won, but also we just we paddled over the line and carried on. You know, it wasn't full stretch. Now, when you've done that as a crew for a number of years, you then know how to step on again because you've you've learned like how to how to tailor yourself to know when to peak and like what more to go for. And you start tweaking, you're constantly tweaking, well, for me anyway, you're constantly tweaking things and refining just to get it just right. And, you know, then we go to the final, you know where the next step's coming from. I don't think we, we probably didn't necessarily know what the next step should be from having a really good race in the semi. So when it came to the fight and the, the race plan was, um, I can't, actually I can't quite remember, but I don't think it was like, setting out to do anything dramatically different, right? It was, um, I, th I think, it, I'm trying to remember now, but it, it was largely to do the same thing, but not not to not to do anything crazy, right? Because we felt like it was probably ours to lose and um, to build on the semi-final. What I think ended up happening was we were probably a little bit nervous and because we hadn't had that history as a crew, like it comes out consistency, then when we went off the start, it was just a bit hesitant, right? So we were just clipping the catch for the first half of the race. Um, and what that ended up meaning was we were a little bit slower, but actually we hadn't burned that much energy. So, because when you miss a bit on the front, you're still working for it. You're not really getting hold yeah. of it. You're sort of washing through it a bit, right? Um, and so it came to the last 500. And, uh, yeah, you thank thankfully, Hodgie Pete and Steve are pretty good at winding up. And those guys have been together as a crew for a while. Right. But literally, you're, you're you're panicking into the last 500. But I would say what what was different in that it did it didn't feel like a it didn't feel like a panic. I don't remember thinking we're down by that way we're going to lose like that feeling. If we did one thing really well, I don't remember that feeling ever creeping in. Like we're still yeah. left down. And I've been in lots of races where you know you know you're constantly trying to check. You got that feeling right? There's a finish line. You got the other crew. Are you going to catch them up? And you're constantly doing that calculation, right? You're yeah. Like, at some point, you know it's not going to work, and then 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 the crew's lost it, right? And that you just feel it in the crew; it sags. Um, but that never happened. I just remember everyone was winding up and just kept going through it. It didn't feel when I say panicked. It was like charging for it early because Steve was calling it early. But I don't remember feeling we ever came out of the pattern. It wasn't like right, just heads down and you go, and everyone shortens up. It was all still within the pattern. Um, and uh, like to be fair, like Hodgie and Pete have done that a lot of times in, in other races. They did that to Gregors and me in one of the trials. Like yeah. they're, they're pretty good at knowing their own speed and winding up. So the, the the first half we didn't have a great race, but we hadn't burnt all our energy. So we 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 started to get hold of it in the last five hundred meters. <laughs> Thankfully, the Aussies blew. Um, so we came through in the last last hundred meters or so, um, and then afterwards. I think everyone else's reaction was much more emotional and, you know, very concerned because we were down so much. But I don't remember that feeling in the boat. I don't remember feeling it's out of control, even though it looked like that. I really didn't. Um, and I, I wouldn't put it down necessarily to be like, utterly belief like we're going to win. It was just more, you focused on what you're doing. Um, I've got my job here and Stevie's making yeah. the calls and like, like, you know, P and Hodgie are doing their job and I'm going to do mine and, um, you know, say a few things. And that's not to say I'm not, I wasn't present in the race because it's very easy to also have races where you let other people take responsibility and you're like, I'm not going to, you know, and you're like a bit passive. It's not that. It was, um, I remember it was just, it was a focused race. 
Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a great first half at all. Um, but I think, like to be fair to ourselves, we had we had spoken about the fact we had no time together. So th- there was a we'd set an expectation that this isn't going to necessarily be perfect. Um, you know, they're going to have to dig for it, and someone's going to do something, some surprise. So you know, and that that's like half the difference, isn't it? If you get if you get people who who have got You'd be more worried when you know when you get you've every personality right has strengths and weaknesses. If you've got some personalities who you know get a bit more flustered under pressure in those situations, yeah. yes, we'd have we'd have probably played. With. But none of those guys are ones who get who who are the ones that panic or fluster. Um, so that's uh, that was lucky for me. Yeah. When did you decide you weren't going to row the next year in two thousand and nine? You were going to take it off. Uh, I was pretty sure uh, at that point. Um, yeah, def- definitely. I mean, it, it's. Um, I, I think I. It's a funny one. I don't think I'd ever seen myself as like just a rower. Yeah. And I was always conscious of what I was going to do afterwards. After rowing, it's. I'm not. You know, it's. It's. Um, uh, it. Yeah, it is finding the right thing afterwards. And I knew I needed to get some work experience. And the best way to do that is take yourself out. So um, I want to do some traveling and, you know, uh, so to take some time out. Um, and does that mean you suffer physically? Probably a little bit, but I was never going to be a big engine anyway. So um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it was, a, I think, just a perfectly rational thing to do. Um, and yeah, I also get quite, I think, you know, get, I can be very intense around rowing, uh, well, a lot of people, right? And you get very focused in it and you need to step back and take away and build up your motivation again. My motivation is not, I, I've got certain, like, I, I'd say a bit sort of short-term um, focus. Um, I'd love to have more of a mentality where you can churn out and like be committed to things, but I need, I need, I need a bit of a carrot right in front of me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Four years at Cavisham, just churning out on an ergo wasn't, you know, I'd have got to year two into three and probably have been injured and then, <laughs> and then you know, deteriorated. Um, needed time out. Um, you build up motivation, like a reason for why you're doing it. And then, and also, I think, I think I was still figuring out, I remember coming back, swapping sides, actually. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, there, there's the work experience side as well. I, I think, I knew I was, I, th- I thought if I was going to do London, I'm going to stop after London and then um, want to know what I'm going to do. And, and I, I can be incredibly incisive, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but yeah. at least I had some work experience and went and did, did a few things, which had I not done, had I not had an internship, I don't think I'd have got the job afterwards that I did uh, ah. in London. And had I not got that, I think the last 10 years would have, well, I don't know, you know, you never know what I've done, but it, a lot of it, a lot of, you know, setting yourself up for the career afterwards. A lot of things I didn't do particularly well, but I think I think that was one thing that's um, uh, I think has been a good move. Um, following London is getting getting into a into something that's given me given me some direction afterwards of uh, give me a skills a new skill set quickly. Yeah. and then learning something you know like properly tested in something completely else. Not not always a fun time because. You know, pretty average and getting told told how to be better by people ten years younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> but like, whenever you start, whenever you start new, you're always a novice. Um, yeah. So you've got to go through that. And starting another career, um, yeah, is, is yeah, for all those reasons, right? You you, you 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 if you set yourself up, I think you've got a long life, right? And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, for me, sort of having that, I think was useful then going into London as well, at least having some things behind me. Um, to, to Co- coming back after injury, because I know you had a year out for injury, you got into this lightning quick four. Um, at the same time that Hodgie and Pete Reed were in this in the middle of this pairs project, and Jürgen was coaching the four, you had a new coach, John West. And I know one of the things that uh, that, that struck you was just how protective Jürgen was of the pair and 
how he was with boats outside of that, particularly your four, because your four were like, you know, challenges to the pair in terms of percentage times and gold medal times. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, we, yeah, so the 2004 was a lot of fun. And I think we all got on and we also had a common, under, we had a common perception of a pattern of rowing. So putting the boat together was very easy. Gregors and I fit together very well. Rick and, well, particularly like Rick and Matt row with Gregors. And Langers, I, you know, we, we have a similar pattern. Mm. Um, so the boat went very quickly straight off the bat, found the right combination, um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and then also, yeah, we had a, uh, yeah, some really good races. I remember the serve was really good, good. Just, just you know, just um, a sort of a free speed on the boat, right? Where you, you don't really need to try and think about it, but the timing really works. And then you find that you're knackered at the end of the race, but you you not felt like you put the effort in until until you stopped over the line and yeah. you got speed out of it, right? And, um, yeah, and then obviously you're competitive between crews because then that's the open stop bay with Pete and Andy. Um, and so you're all competitive. That's like completely natural. Um, and I think Jürgen had that as the pairs project. And so they had a, you know, a pretty tremendous battle with the New Zealand crew over, over that period. Um, and Jürgen, I could clearly try, wanted to see that then succeed and tried, tried, they all tried like <laughs> to do that. Uh, but New Zealand, you know, New Zealand were a phenomenal pair, right? So, yeah. um, no slide because um like both crews have done but well particularly i think in bled that year they both went phenomenally quick um but selection and fours things like that is i'm not saying it's politics but um you know i guess the four was broken up quite quickly from being a world championship four to then into the olympic year um, and Jürgen had a had a, a pretty clear view of what he wanted to do, and so uh, I think also the four with with Pete, Andy, Gregs, and I had done some very quick trials at times as well in in testing before the other before the two and four four had gone very quick, and so there was evidence, you know, of that four being quick, um, and so I think uh, Jürgen then prioritised the four games here, and then it was open game for for who goes into that four, right? Um, but yeah, I think, you know, if you're World Championship 4, you feel it's yours to then be taken away from. But I think it then, which was always, you know, I think the mantra, you know, if you're World Champion, then it's yours for, to be taken away. But it was taken, it was taken apart. <laughs> um, and that, yeah, that's that's the system though. Was that the uh, best 4 you've rode in? That 2011 crew? I don't, uh, I don't like comparing between best Yeah. Four. Fair enough. Right? And you can pick different different aspects because they're all different experiences. Um, I think I said with the 2011 one, it was a good fun unit that worked, right? And that's always nice. And we had a really good year. 2012 was phenomenal because of because of, for entirely different reasons. Um, I think because of actually the challenge. And I think we've, it's interesting when we, we catch up and like speak about it, I think we've all got slightly different perceptions of some of those challenges. My perception was that, that we like finding, we finding the right combination to start with was quite hard. Um, so we went around different combinations and getting that to fit when, when we, we made some really incredible speed randomly. So sometimes like, you know, you do a seat race and everyone just, you don't think about the pattern. You just, you just, you just feel the rhythm. Yeah, there's like a dance song or something like that. You just <laughs> about it. You're, you're not thinking about technique, you're thinking about moving together and making the very quick. And easy as that, we went and I, I can't, we did a 1500 that was world record pace or something, right? And then nine months later, when then we're putting as a crew and selected as a crew, and then you try and do that again, and it's terrible. <laughs> And you're thinking about it and you're thinking your ABCs of how to row and like it should be like this or like he's doing that we should be doing this um and the reason for that is because there, there wasn't I think you know you had you had Pete and Andy who've been rowing together for a, for a number of years right and their way of doing things and a way of doing things with Jürgen right 
So that that was a unit that had operated successfully as a you know with their with their own stuff. And also, you develop your own languages. Even if you talk about the catch, you talk about it in the same way. Yeah. You you might mean slightly different things. And Greg and I had developed our pattern right in the parent before the previous year, and we're very comfortable with how we rode. And so, you know, this point I was making earlier about rowing. You know, it's not just a religion; it becomes embedded in in like this is how I understand the sport and how I understand to go quickly. And what 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 it meant was that. And, and so, what I what I think happened was we would then do some really quick times, but we couldn't go and repeat it, and we didn't know why we did a quick time. <laughs> So we got to Lucerne and um, did a heat, a uh, stonking tailwind. And first half of the race, we were, okay, we were like half length up from New Zealand. Um, and suddenly at 1,000 metres, something clicked. And we just carried on and got quick and quick. And the Hodgie made a few calls. Um, and then we crossed the line and we got a world record. It was 5.37. Uh, which is sensational. Yeah, we took like 10 seconds out and he's in the same house. And I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and then, then, then turned around, uh, thought, oh, this is awesome. We're definitely going to win. Then the next day, raced uh, Australia and it was neck and neck the whole way. And we, we the, the race was just completely average because we went over it. So over above 40, no, no, no length in the stroke, um, didn't have much composure. We won it just, but it was, it was not a good race. Um, and we did. We I don't think we had an understanding of how to like how to go and create that result. Um, so we had a lot of speed, but it was really inconsistent. And so, how do you develop? How do you develop any confidence or like understanding of how I'm going to go and deliver this again? Um, I don't think we nailed that until we lost to Australia in Munich um, till afterwards. And actually, you know, it's part of the part of the season feels very that season feels quite chaotic because you get. You get selected, you only just get selected, and then you go and race. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you go and race again, and you've got to change the things, you go and race again. And then then you get some breathing space to figure it out, which is going up to Silver after, and then you get three or four weeks of calm and collect your thoughts. And actually, if because you've had those three races, whether they've gone well or not, like you you absorb all of that. Yeah. And that's where you make your changes. And I think as a crew, like we made we made like pretty fundamental changes to the way we rode in those last six weeks. What like? I mean, do you remember? And 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 also, Tom, who was? What was the mechanism? Was it Jurgen? Was it Alex Gregory coaching from Bell? Was it you and Alex talking? What what was the? No, it was all of us because all of us recognised it. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it. Yeah, we had some pretty honest chats about like look, looking at look, looking at the race in Munich we had a there was a good opportunity because you just saw Australia there, there was a bit of the race where we just side by side and Australia were like 34 looking looking very calm and composed um and then we we're batting up and down at 38 and going slower you know like, although I remember there was a picture in in one of the papers and it saw us off the start and you basically had Pete and Andy stood at the catch with their legs up, and then Greg's and I with our legs flat. <laughs> um, you know, still at the straight. Like there's, it just we we hadn't figured out how to bring that together, and so this, the the changes afterwards were all about finding points in the stroke to bring us together. So you've got a common understanding of that pattern, and it, and it, it's not just making those changes and like, you know, small things around here. It's just like fundamental things. Like we are going to. We're going to understand the timing around the back end to set us up to roll into the front, like proper fundamentals. And then this is how we are taking the catch. So, like, you know, place the blade, and we are placing the blade, stopping, and we're going to feel that catch and connection together. And then we're going to drive right. And then when you got that connection, then it's all cyclical. Like, start the connection, then your legs start to move, and then your legs come in line. And then when the drive pace comes, then you arrive at the back end on time. And then guess what? The hands move freely around the back end easier anyway. Um, I think it was about being pernickety and getting those changes. And then the, as the, the program goes through, you do it at low rate and then you build up a different pattern, you know, a, a different different um, races. And then you go to a viz and then you're testing it again. And then you're going and doing 1,000 meters, 1,500 2Ks, and you're trying to just generate that again and again. Um, but I think also it was self-driven. 
I think we recognized all four of us and then we decided that the pattern we needed to change to. Um, and then we, we made those changes and then carried them through. I mean, it wasn't always pretty at paddling, but I think when it came to racing, then we, we, we ended up with a really nice pattern. Um, and, um, you know, still needed a bit of tweaking. I think the start, we were still tweaking. The, the start was still a bit uncertain between the heat, the semi, but in the final, though, we nailed it. And that just took a bit of tw tweaking because, because of the lengths we were rowing and you're trying to, like, overthink the back. You're just trying to overthink it, right? Um, uh, you didn't and... get phased by the Australians because were they talking about turning it into a drag race? And, and uh, th there was a lot of... Yeah hype around the whole contest it, between you it, two. um it if it was it backfired because i think it motivated us i remember being because also i'd seen we we knew drew jin's game um sorry to james but it, it worked on it works on matt and james and we we'd seen we had seen we we knew we knew drew jin's game and he'd been writing a blog that year and we, we also felt we should beat them. Like we felt we'd had, um, we felt we had some races that were quite close where we'd run really averagely and we can put a good race together here and we should beat them. And in the semi final, I think we had an okay race and then we still came through. I remember the, there was a lot of debate as well. I think in the, semi-final that, that the Aussies had tapered down the last 500 but I don't I just I just never believe that because I just I don't think Drew Jim or any of that crew would have let someone walk through in the last 500 of the semi Olympic semi-final yeah you just do not you, you do not give up a, a winning opportunity um I think it's you know because we we were quicker and they didn't they hadn't they didn't have a, as much of a sprint in the last bit which I think they tried to rectify in the final because they, they did they did have more, but I think we'd we uh, we had a really good race in the final, um, and I remember that, also the other thing is I remember not not looking forward to it, but I think when you're ready, you're like you're ready to perform and you're not not as apprehensive or as um, you know you want to go and deliver it because you know you can do it, um. And I remember having that that feeling for London, um, for the for the final because it was, and also what that's doing to Beijing because the semi final was like it was probably yeah. a six out of ten, right? And it's like yeah. we can do an eight or a nine here, so let's let's go and do that, right? Whereas in Beijing we'd probably done a nine out of ten in the semi final. It's like well, what do we do next? Um, <laughs> you know how do you how do you make that happen? Um, and it's all reacting to things. That was actually I think in London a lot of it was. And actually, that was what I learned in Athens. That those last couple of weeks, like they never go to plan, and it's not about setting a plan and following the plan. It's about uh, it's about reacting really well to things that are around you. Yeah, yeah. It's all about reacting because the last couple of weeks, you're trying to get your mental, like you're trying to build that confidence. You know, particularly if you're in an eight, like you know, you've got more more variables and more of the mood to get right and like build that up. It's an art form to, to, to get, to, to just react well in those last couple of weeks, um, to get the balance right from race to race to then nail it on a final. Um, and then when you do it away, you're like, oh, that was easy. That wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is, it, it is, but it is hard because it can go wrong so often and, and not quite, not quite get it. Um, yeah. A couple of things. Um, you must have had views on the whole issue around Jürgen Grobel losing his job or stepping out early. Um, I, I think it was losing his job rather than stepping out early. Um, back in, what would it have been? 2020, 2021, my, my, my head goes now. Uh, back, back in 2020. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you as well what you thought of, uh, you know, what, if you watch the fours race in the Tokyo Olympics and what your emotions or feelings or thoughts were about that? Uh, it's all just really rather sad. Um, and I think unnecessary. I think, um, I, I'll be honest, I am not close to a lot of the things, but, um, 
I mean, where do you begin on it? Like your point on Jurgen, strategically, like getting getting rid of him the year before Olympics. I remember trying to think like, okay, maybe there's some logic in this because if you want to change coach and you want to try and find a coach, if if he's going to go anywhere and you're going to try and find a coach, the best time to find him is trying to set up one before everyone's already gone. I don't know, but that that clearly wasn't part of it. Um, it sounds like it was a clash of personalities and methodology, but like, yeah, it's um, but but regardless, um. Did it change the results? I don't know. Like I think the results in in Tokyo were were the same or similar to the you know rest of the Olympiad. Yeah. So yeah. I think you can, you know, and it is a system that you build over over the over those five years, right? And if Jurgen was was at least for the men's side, you know, covering four of those five, like there's a fair amount of responsibility still with that. Um, but even so, that's obviously been the, the lynch point for like people like splitting people into camps, which is the, the unfortunate bit. Um, and then some of the reaction afterwards. Um, look, I think uh, I think um, that, I mean the current squad. I thought were really like were fantastic. Like the athletes are really really good and really. Um, and the guys in the four had a fantastic approach going into Tokyo. The, the guys I've been, I, I knew and, and chatting to, like, yes, they didn't have Jurgen, but like, well, it's the first, like, you know, this is an opportunity to to set apart. And you know, actually, if we win, we're the first sport to win without Jurgen. Yeah. Um, you know, that, and that's true, right? Because we've all had a protection of winning with Jurgen. And if you if you had Jurgen behind you, you know, you know, there's it's the it's the sort of the survivorship or success bias, right? Where the opposition already know they probably should lose, and then you feel like you should win just because you've got that history behind you. Yeah. Um, so it was a tall order, but their approach to it was really good. Like they're really up for it and come together really well as a four. And they had Robin, um, you know, help <laughs> helping them figure out some of the, the technical technical points to make them, you know, step up. Where I think the previous years they were, they weren't in that position to buy for a gold, but I think they were that year. Um, and then what happened in the final was uh, I don't think anyone you can't blame anyone because I mean I've done that in races. Yeah. Um, and it's really unfortunate. It is just really unfortunate. I don't think you can I don't think you can say, well this happened or Dad Jurgen, you know whatever this attitude or like the nonsense of if you'd had you know what some other Olympian or carrying on. Um, you know, to carry that through of continuity. I mean, we, we'd lost all the Olympians because of the, the previous cycle. So there are them, but you just had Mo, right? So yeah, you the eight, put them in the four. Where you say, well, the eight lost because you didn't have Mo. It's like set a new trend, and the guy you've got to go out and build up your own confidence. And with where you're going to do things, set a new legacy. So I think that I thought um, the interaction I had was they they were on a good track for. Even though they didn't have Jurgen, they'd set themselves up for, for going and doing that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, those results—they were all fourth places instead of medals, right? So it's very easy to to, to make a stark contrast and and um, throw things around. I think, which um, which is fine if you're a pundit. That's the other thing I think that probably made people. The thing when you're an athlete, I think it, it must be a problem in a lot of sports, right? I think cricket yeah. has. Because if you're one of the if you're one of the commentators afterwards, you're an ex-athlete. Yeah. And when you're in the squad, there's nothing worse than a past ex-athlete commentating on you or criticizing you, particularly if you know there's plenty of other failings or yeah. <laughs> other other you know other examples to sound like, you know, um, whatever. But that's I think if you're an athlete, you've got to understand that's the commentator's job. So forget about it and don't get worked up. Um, and that's just the reality. And like cricket has it a lot worse, right? Think of all the ex-cricketers who used to be ex-captains and, and whatever, and having to like criticise on 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 cricket their own or whatever. Um, when you're in, when you're the, when you're one of the the, the 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 people in the team trying to get it right, and you're constantly bombarded by criticism or negativity, when you feel like those people should be your advocates and like helping you, yeah, yeah, um, that's partly where I think this stems from as well. That's my thought, anyway. Um, yeah. Um, 
So it's just really important. And then, like, I, I, I thought the changes, like, I'm not close to it, so uh, they're sort of observations, right? I, I thought that a lot of the changes that were looking to be made into the program, certainly on the app, clearly at the end, a lot of things uh, proven out not to be good. But a lot of the initial changes were all things I'm very strongly supportive of. Um, a more pastoral approach to the athletes, yeah. asking their opinions, a 360 review, the first time ever having a 360 review of coaches, um, having feedback going around, um, opening up, delegating so that you're using all your expertise across the coaching and sports staff. Like you can't say those things, um, uh, you know, if done correctly. I mean, well, that was the thing I think, a lot of people thought that was those were excellent things to start with in, when, when there was a bit of a transition right with with a new team management earlier in that cycle. Um, but then clearly things after that, there are a lot of other things that went very wrong and not set up the right way, which is when, and, and obviously notably Jürgen team, I mean, I still don't understand it because yeah. it's obviously what happens if things go wrong, where does the blame, the blame, the, there's, there's, there's no one, the, the person who should be accountable is not there. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, that, it just, that, that's just dotty. I didn't understand that. Um, and, um, look, I, I mean, I, I also think all the guys are going back, like, phenomenally strong. The Ergo scores, I hope they've, the other thing is, like, as, as, as hopefully is evidenced by the beginning of this call, um, because <laughs> this is, like, losing lots of things can turn out really well. So if they all feel really bitter, and annoyed by that, the results of Tokyo. If you use that right, that can be fantastic. So um, you can learn a lot from that, and you can develop your own confidence without needing to have a having a coach with the legacy. Like we yeah. need to do that anyway, and the athletes are doing that. Like, don't shut that out. And that's also harder to do. Like it, and also for me, would be more would be more rewarding. Um, I enjoy the independence of not of uh, that, that, and, that, and that's something to give Jürgen credit on that. Um, where 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 most coaches usually because because you're, you're stressed by by the fact your 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 name's against this result, right? You get control over, controlling over the crew. Yeah, the lots of coaches have a very defined pattern of how you should row. Um, or this crew, what you should do, right? And then think, then controlling leading up to the race. Whereas actually, Jurgen, whether it's design or not, um, steps back and lets you as a crew go and go and figure a lot of it out. Because you know, if you've got a cumulative of whatever forty years rowing experience between you, between the, the four of you, then you, you've got a lot of you've got a lot of the answers. You need to go and you need to go and be adults and and take responsibility and figure that out. Um, and I think that's actually what ends up happening. Um, uh, and also that allows for a lot of flexibility in, in, in how you're going to row. There's not someone dictating the pattern. You can, you got flexibility to, to, to blend things together. Um, that's not to say, you know, having a very constrained pattern is not a bad thing, but you just, it's just a different program. Um, and usually more mature athletes don't buy into it. <laughs> yeah. If you don't the rowing you're less likely to listen to a coach coming on telling you have to do this and this um for what it's worth i think this year is going to be a great year for the british team i just think you, you know the the closeness of the pairs at the trials a couple of pairs under 630 um you know a lot of the team back from Beijing, uh, from tokyo I, I think it's going to be a good year for the team good Men's team, anyway. I'm not sure about the women's. Um, yeah. Tom, do you ever row now? Uh, occasionally, I put it down as like social rowing. Yeah, try and avoid competitive row. <laughs> yeah. Um, so down at Crabtree, occasion, very occasionally, not enough. Um, but if you can get, you put your name down on Saturday morning, you get out in an eight. That can be a lot of fun. And if it's yeah. just in that crew, as soon as, as soon as you get two eights out. It's not fun because then you get on the boat and everyone gets competitive and everyone everyone has like idiots. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, I occasionally, but I've over the last year or so I've been out three times, four times. Um, obviously COVID and then 
just not being in the pattern of it and then Theo you know, and, and having a new job, which has been uh, pretty, pretty... So you've got, you got a new job, you've got a new house and you've got a new baby and they're all new, happening. New baby, yeah, new baby in two days, all right, and then a new house in a week. <laughs> That's just... But I'm a year into the new job, so um, I'll settle yeah. into that. So it's not so new. Oh, wow. Tom, I can't believe you found time to, to chat tonight. It's it's been great. We've we've been over well over an hour now. Um and it's been fantastic. I, I can't thank you enough because I know what time's like when you got full on a new job and you've got a family responsibilities. And um thanks very much. We we we'll, well, absolute pleasure to speak to you, Crossy, as always. Brilliant. We'll end the live part of this interview now. Thanks, Tom. Thanks.